So this morning we bring to a close our series on the church, a display of God's glory and a gift of his grace. This has been the overarching theme for the last 10 weeks. So here's my game plan this morning. I, I want to start with the big picture. What exactly have I been saying about the church and how do we move from the big picture into what we actually practice as a local church on a weekly basis? And I want you to understand how those two connect. What we do in the minutia of our church life is connected to the glory of God. I hope you've seen that, and I want to remind you of it again this morning. And let me, let me also say, and I'll make reference to this at different points, uh, but we will we'll say more about what I am covering this morning on Wednesday night at the Family Forum. But for now, how do deacons and elders and how does church membership, how does all of that connect to the glory of God? I want to hopefully answer that question this morning. How does it connect to the health of the church? How is it good for you, his people? Let me answer by offering you four stated truths. So there is a handout uh, and that handout is not a syllabus. Thank you very much, Jason Merritt. It is to help you see the flow of where we're going this morning. Um, so I just want you to be able to see in front of you uh, how I'm progressing through this, and then it will lead us into a discussion uh, ultimately about uh, deacons this morning. So each of these four stated truths explained consecutively, each one building on the previous and leading into the next. So truth number one, truth number one, God's chief concern is that he glorifies himself in all things. Therefore, the church is primarily and ultimately about God. Now, this may sound obvious to many of you, but this is not a foundational truth for most churches. Friends, we see this in a number of ways throughout Scripture. You'll notice the bullet points there. Jesus is the chief shepherd and the head of the church. The church exists for Jesus and is held together by Jesus. The church has a Jesus-centered message. The church is God's chosen way of revealing himself to the world. Brothers and sisters, whatever else may change at Redeemer, I hope this never does. This church exists to relentlessly declare in every possible way the glory and the majesty of the triune God. So truth number two. God breathed out the means by which we can know him and walk in obedience to him. The Bible is authoritative in all matters of faith and practice. Therefore, if the church ignores the spoken instruction of her head, then she cannot glorify him as he intends. In other words, if we're going to be God-centered, we must also be Bible-saturated. The Bible is totally sufficient for the entire process of spiritual growth from justification to glorification. The Bible is written to the church, both the Old and New Testaments. The New Testament is both descriptive and prescriptive in its instruction to the church. Furthermore, Paul's letters are inspired documents written to actual churches and are intended to be both instructive and authoritative for the church until Christ returns. So, brothers and sisters, may we always be people of the book. Truth number three, therefore, the church stands in subjection to her maker and must gladly obey his instruction. If the church chooses her own way and dismisses the instruction of her chief shepherd, the consequences are devastating and totally unnecessary. 
the church will fail to accurately and brightly display the glory of God. We've talked about that a lot throughout this series. The church will demonstrate the wisdom of men instead instead of the Spirit's power. The church will confuse the gospel. And God's people will not be cared for physically or spiritually. Church leaders will lead without joy. These are some of the devastating consequences when the church departs from the word of God. So finally, stated truth number four, armed with this framework, the New Testament church must acknowledge the importance of operating with a clearly biblical structure, understanding, friends, that this fourth truth connects to the first. Jesus is the chief shepherd and the head of the church. May there never be any doubt about that. Elders gifted by God and affirmed by the gathered congregation are called to lead as under-shepherds. Deacons gifted by God and affirmed by the gathered congregation are called to be lead servants. And then the congregation, called out of darkness by the sovereign grace of God, must be meaningfully connected to and invested in each other. Pastor Scott Brown wrote, Moses and the other leaders were not left to do whatever they thought was best. They were expected to live according to the law, God's spoken word. Every time God's people returned to him, it necessarily involved them returning to his word. The same is true in the New Testament. God's word is primary, sufficient, and authoritative, even regarding our methodology and organization. The pattern of our church life should conform as much as possible to the pattern of church life found in Scripture. So friends, that's why we've been doing this series. That's why in a couple of weeks we'll start walking our way through a book of the Bible, which will be our pattern here for years and years and years to come. We want to hear from God. You don't don't want to hear my opinion, and you shouldn't care what my opinion is. You come to church to hear from God, and so we open his word, and we look within it, and we know that God breathed this out for us. So in this commitment and practice, we reflect the character of God. We make the gospel clear. We care for those in spiritual and physical need, And because God is so kind to us, which we were just singing about, because God is so kind to us, friends, we will experience the full joy of following our chief shepherd, Jesus Christ. In other words, if our conviction is that the word of God is sufficient and authoritative for all matters of doctrine and practice, then Redeemer Bible Church will always imperfectly but faithfully display God's glory. And we will function as a gift of God's grace in the lives of his people. And we aim at both of those. So with that big picture in mind, let me spend the rest of our time focusing on the role of deacons according to Scripture. And I love that we're finishing with this because deacons in so many ways encapsulate what the body of Christ is all about. Humble sacrificial, loving, faithful, selfless service for the glory of God and for the good of his body. So here's what we'll see in the remainder of our time. The biblical function of deacons, the biblical qualifications for deacons, and the vision for deacons at Redeemer Bible Church. Again, at the Family Forum on Wednesday, I'll say much more about what I'm sharing this morning. And of course, this is only the beginning of a conversation rooted in and framed by God's word about what a healthy diaconate should look like at Redeemer. So take your copy of the scriptures and turn to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, first the biblical function of deacons. 
The book of Acts begins with the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, followed by Peter's bold declaration of the gospel, calling sinners to repent of their sin and believe in the crucified and risen Christ. And if you're familiar at all with God's word, you know that thousands turn in faith to Christ and the New Testament church is born. Those whom God had rescued and redeemed came together in community. In fact, in Acts 2, you have this beautiful text of Scripture where it describes this newly formed church of young believers. This is what it says, being devoted to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So this is what's happening in the early church. God is working in miraculous ways. The church is growing. Many are embracing the gospel, being made new in Christ. And as is the case in every single church in the history of the church, they begin to face some challenges. We read of one particular challenge in verse 6. Look at verse 1. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number... A complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. As the gospel is being declared and the Holy Spirit is moving, some Greek-speaking Jews are becoming followers of Christ. And among these Greek-speaking Jews, there are a number of widows. And there arose a complaint that these Hellenistic widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Now, we don't know for sure that this precise moment is the institution of the office of deacon, but it seems likely, and if not, this particular text is still instructive for us as we consider the function of deacons. There are actually two important needs referred to in the first four verses. One is explicitly stated, and the other is implied. First, the widows needed to be served. These sisters were not a nuisance, but they were needy in a very real sense. We know that these early Christians shared all that they had, sometimes selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to those in need. So we know they wanted to serve each other, and yet these widows were being overlooked. They took seriously their responsibility to serve each other, They knew that it magnified the Christ who had given himself to satisfy their greatest need. So that's sort of the primary explicitly stated need in the text. But there is a second need implied in verse 4. The need for prayer and the ministry of the word. This young church and the widows within would uh, would not live by bread alone, but by the word of God. Friends, they knew that at the center of their life together, at the core of their new mission to make disciples was the ministry of the word and prayer. So there are two needs. Both are important, but one is more foundational than the other. The widows needed to be served, but not at the expense of the ministry of the word and prayer. The leaders of this young and growing church needed a way to serve the physical needs of these widows without taking time and energy away from the ministry of the word and prayer. So what do they do? 
verse 3. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. I love this. I love this whole picture. As Christ is being proclaimed, the Holy Spirit is acting upon dead sinners, making them alive in Christ, bringing them to repentance and faith, and the church is growing numerically. As they grow, they identify a need, and then they find a way to meet the need that the Spirit has created by his own sovereign work. Right? This is actually the opposite of how the church now typically operates. Right? We do demographic studies and other things, and then we develop ministries to reach certain groups of people. Here in Acts, the church just does what the church is supposed to do. And the spirit of the living God does what only he can do. And then the church has to come up with a ministry, not in an effort to make something happen, but in response to what God has already made happen. And now the church simply needs to react and respond to God's sovereign and undeniable work. So brothers and sisters, I think there's a lesson for us here. Let's commit ourselves to make disciples. Right? That's the strategy. Make disciples. Give ourselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Let's spend time together. Let's sacrificially and lovingly serve each other, and especially those in need. And in all of it, let's proclaim the gospel and embody its implications. And then let's just see what the Holy Spirit might be pleased to do. And as the Spirit moves and works among us, we'll figure out ways to respond to what he is already doing. As this happened, friends, I don't, I don't think we'll have to look for deacons. I think they will be obvious. It will simply be another way the Spirit is working, making clear to us those who are gifted to serve the body as deacons. Now back to the text. In the two needs that are presented, here we see the key difference between the function of elders and deacons. Elders, or the church leaders here, must give themselves primarily to the ministry of the word and prayer. This is indispensable. But on the other hand, this chosen group of seven, they are to give themselves primarily to the meeting of physical needs, the serving of tables, and the distribution of food. So perhaps this would be a helpful way to summarize the distinction between the role or the function of elders and deacons. Elders are servant leaders called and gifted by God to serve the spiritual needs of the congregation, while deacons are lead servants called and gifted by God to serve the physical needs of the congregation, which we know are never merely physical. So with the biblical function of deacons in mind, turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, where we will see the biblical qualifications for deacons. First Timothy chapter 3. Look with me at verse 8. Deacons, likewise, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanders, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, 
managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. So here we find a particular a list, a list of character qualities that deacons must possess in order to serve the church in the way that Christ desires. The items on the list are not exhaustive, but they are essential. Now, I'm not going to take time to address each of these qualities this morning. In fact, this Wednesday, again, at the Family Forum, we will be giving you an evaluation and affirmation guide for both elders and deacons, and this guide will walk you through each of the biblical qualifications listed for these offices. But connect these to what we read in Acts 6. In Acts 6, the congregation was called to choose men, what? Of good repute, full of the Spirit, and of wisdom. All the Apostle Paul is doing now in his letter to Timothy is explaining and expanding on what it looks like for someone to be of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom. Right? Look at verses 8 through 12 again. Verse 8, dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience or, or fully understand and embrace the gospel. Verse 10, they must be blameless. Verse 12, the husband of one wife. Verse 12, managing their household well. Friends, these qualities make perfect sense when you consider the role or function of a deacon. Right? They are selflessly serving those in need, caring for the physical needs within the body of Christ, fostering unity and displaying the love of Christ to the onlooking world. Now, those things simply won't happen if a church has deacons who are undignified, slanderous, drunk, greedy, dishonest, theologically confused, and careless in their love and leadership at home. But God-gifted, Spirit-led, Christ-exalting deacons will both bring glory to God and will be a wonderful gift to their brothers and sisters in Christ. As important as these qualifications are, D.A. Carson points out that the list as it relates to elders and by implication deacons is actually quite unremarkable. By and large, these are qualities that every Christian should be aspiring to. Now, for the sake of clarity, let me remind you that there is one qualification for elders that we, we do not find in relation to deacons, though many are the same. Elders must have the ability to teach, which makes sense because the function of elders is wrapped up in the ministry of the word. There is a certain authority that comes with the office of elder. When God calls and gifts a man for the office of elder, he is calling him to labor in the word and prayer. So there is an important distinction between both the qualifications and the function of elders and deacons. Now let me draw your attention back to the text where we will see yet another difference between the office of elder and Deacon, look at verse 11. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. This is an interesting and debatable text because what the ESV translates as their wives at the beginning of verse 11 could also be translated simply as women. In fact, your Bible probably has a small note somewhere pointing that out. So friends, one of two things is happening here. Either the text is talking about women deacons, or it is referring to the wives of male deacons. Both positions have merit, and disagreements over this should in no way be divisive. 
Again, some understand verse 11 to be making reference to the wives of deacons, and others believe the text is referring to women in the role of deacon. But either way, either way, we end up with gifted and qualified women serving diaconally. Now, Pastor Thabiti Anabwile, a council member of the Gospel Coalition and a well-respected and very wise pastor explains and draws a conclusion as to which option is correct. This is what he writes. Both the NIV and ESV contain marginal notes for the word wives, indicating the term may be translated women. So the text could either have in view the wives of deacons, if you accept the supply of their in the verse, women deacons, or women who assist deacons but are not themselves deacons. Because there, he writes, is not explicit in the text, and the word likewise seems to indicate another category in the list, I lean with many others in understanding this verse to refer to women deacons, or at the least women who assist the deacons. Moreover, there are instances elsewhere in the New Testament that seem to indicate the apostolic church had women deacons. I think of Romans 16.1 where Phoebe is described as a deacon. So brothers and sisters, the conversation about women serving the church as part of the diaconate is something that your elders have been praying about, studying, discussing, and then praying about some more. Because we see in God's word a distinction between the gifting and function of elders and deacons. And this is important. So I grew up in a church context where deacons served functionally like elders. That's not the way it is here. We see these as two distinct offices and we recognize the different functions. So because we see in God's word a distinction between the gifting and function of elders and deacons, and because we see ample evidence in the text of Scripture to support women serving as deacons, it is our joy. It is our joy to invite you into a conversation about this matter. But we want you to know that your entire elder team is in favor of of expanding the diaconate to include biblically gifted and qualified women. Now, you'll hear more about this on Wednesday, but we wanted to introduce it to you and invite you into this conversation, seeing that Scripture is our guide. We see in God's Word support for women serving as Deacons, and therefore we see this as a wonderful opportunity for women to flourish in their gifting for the building up of this body and for the glory of Jesus Christ. So this brings me to my final and very brief point. The vision for deacons at Redeemer Bible Church. Let me offer you two thoughts here as we close. Number one. As the elders have talked through this, we see this not only as an opportunity to more faithfully follow the pattern of Scripture, but we see this as a tangible way, a tangible way in which our entire church will be built up through the many previously unrecognized and in some ways suppressed gifts of the godly sisters that God has placed in this faith family. Two, we believe that God, according to his own infinite and perfect wisdom, provides for all the needs of his people. So here's what I mean by that. As we move forward with renewed passion and a sense of earnest expectation for all that God will do in and through Redeemer Bible Church, we We believe that many gifted brothers and sisters will be recognized for the various ways in which God has gifted them to serve the body. For our part, we hope that by expanding the diaconate to include both men and women, 
and by expanding the roles and responsibilities of the deacons, we will experience God's grace in new and unexpected ways. So again, we'll say more about this on Wednesday evening. One final word of encouragement, and this comes from the brother I mentioned just a few minutes ago, Pastor Thabiti Anabwile. In the same article I referenced earlier, he writes the following, and I heartily agree and cannot improve upon it, so I share it with you. This is what he writes. I believe answering the question, what meaningful role can and should women play in the life of the church? is as important a practical and spiritual question as we can consider. It's a question that affects at least half, usually much more, of our congregations. It's a question that touches directly upon gospel-ordered church life. It's a question that potentially restricts or broadens Christian freedom for women in our churches. It's a question that either employs or unemploys the gifts the Lord himself sovereignly grants to our sisters. How we answer the question must be shaped and limited by the word of God, the Beatty writes, and we heartily agree with. But, But we all approach the word of God with assumptions, presuppositions, biases, historical understandings, and personal filters. None of us come to the word as empty slates. We have tilts that may or may not be known to us. That's why humility, openness, and community become so important in discussions like these. We need others to help us see and learn. So I hope that is true of us. Again, our aim in all of this, more than anything, we want this church to be a display of God's glory and a gift of his grace where men and women can flourish according to God's good design. As you've heard this morning, we believe that a biblically defined and robustly functioning diaconate is a huge part of this hope and vision. In fact, in Acts 6, after the seven deacons were recognized to begin serving the elders could return to the ministry of the word and prayer. What does the text say next? What happened? Acts 6, verse 7. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly. All of this is connected, friends. And so we pray with bold expectation. God, make it so at Redeemer Bible Church. And in the Twin Cities, may the word of God increase and may the number of disciples multiply greatly. Let's pray.